Okay, good afternoon to all of our listeners and welcome to Hard Talk Between Sisters. We are streaming from the islands of the Caribbean this Friday afternoon. We know that the end of the week has come. Some of you are still in the office. Some have winded down for the day or for the week and you're just relaxing and looking forward to an enjoyable weekend. So we am just gonna ask you to sit back, relax, grab a hot drink or a cold drink, and let's get into a conversation. My guest this afternoon is a dear, dear friend and colleague of mine by the name of Dr. Shilma Roberts, and that's Shilma, S-H-E-R-M-A. Shilma Roberts comes from the island of Tobago. She was originally born in Tobago, and she now resides in the island of Barbados, still in the Caribbean region. And I'm just going to read a bit about Shuma. Who is Shuma Roberts? And she's going to tell us some more about who she is. Shuma is currently a senior lecturer, lecturer in tourism at the Sajiko Cape Hill School of Business and Management, right? Currently, um, she also served there as a director for the School of Graduate Studies and Research at the Cape Hill campus in Barbados. And we do have a branch of the University of the West Indies in Barbados where they do law and obviously they do tourism and other subjects. So Shema um, pioneered and developed the Cape Tourism Syllabus. So those of you who did tourism for Cape exams, that's the advanced level exam, Shema was a part of that. She was also the chief examiner for the subject for two years from 2014 to 2016. She was the first chairperson of the Tobago Tourism Agency, which I think they call And um, she's been working in tourism. She's been involved in the chairperson of the Tourism Advisory Council in Barbados, Barbados Tourism Product Authority, she has co-edited books, and she's the lead editor of several published volumes. So that is Shilma in a nutshell. Besides all of that academia and all that wonderful professional work, Shilma um, is an alumnus of the Brunel University, the University of Surrey, and of course, the University of the West Indies. But most importantly, Shilma loves to walk on the beach, and she's in the best place to walk on the lovely beaches in Barbados. She loves to plan house lines and she loves her home gardening and the traveling. So Shuma, Dr. Shuma Roberts, welcome to our program this afternoon on Hard Talk Between Sisters. Thank you very much, Alana, and good afternoon to the listening audience. I really appreciate you having me here. I think I'm um, within those pioneering ladies. So I'm very happy to be in the first <laughs> set of <laughs> yes. um, interviews that you're hosting. So yes, and this, that is, go on. Yes, and this is our fourth, this is my fourth interview on Hard Talk Between Sisters. And I'm really honored to have you. It is such a joy to reconnect with you recently and to be able to catch up on, on our lives basically and where both of us have reached professionally and even personally. Um, we've come a very long way from the islands of Tobago. For those of you who don't know, I also was born in the island of Tobago. And Shuma and I were actually primary school, primary school mates, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, look at yeah. that, eh? look at that. We haven't changed much, we more or less the same, eh? you know? Yes, pretty much, Alana, pretty much. <laughs> I always remember you as the... My uh my school mate with the two thick plats and I think I probably had three thick plats, but yes. <laughs> I think you had more than three thick plats and your plats were thicker than mine for sure. I remember that. Plenty uh, here. Small yeah. frame and plenty here. I remember. Small frame and plenty here. So it's a joy to be here. So as Alana said, I grew up in Scarborough, Tobago. I we normally start with our family of origin. So I am the last of five children. I'm a twin with a boy. Mm -hmm. um, I attended the Scarborough Methodist Primary School in Tobago. And I have to mention that because that school, um, I remember it bordered or bordered um, A&R Robinson's home. So mm -hmm. we were always yeah. in the company of 
the greats and we probably didn't yeah. know it at the time. Yes. I remember being a guide and that was, I think, my first introduction to civic duty, um, knocking on doors, doing um, dollar tasks and so on. And, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes when you look back on, on these and the groups and the clubs that you were in and maybe at the time they didn't mean much but you look back and you recognize the type of discipline that they would have sort of inured in your in, in you as a person you know and mm -hmm. that idea that you are more than just an individual you're part of a community yes i was also quite active in the wesleyan holiness um cinnamon hill wesleyan holiness church because i got I became a Christian at the age of 13. And so I think that pretty much changed the, the course of my life in a way that, you know, I could not have dreamt about. Um, my first introduction in tourism was working at the Turtle Beach Hotel. And I always remember I started off as an income auditor. And Alana, you would know that an income auditor mm -hmm. works the, grave night, the, the graveyard shift. Yes, so yes. At, at 12 midnight and you ended at 7 a.m., Yes. Uh, but of course, I wanted a job, and therefore, that was the one on offer. I remember doing it three nights, and then after three nights, I thought, no, no, man, this, mm -hmm. I, I can't be doing this at all. So I went into the gym at the time. His name was Seth, Mr. Settler, and he was English. And I said, um, I, I can't be doing this. You know, this is not working out for me. And he said, my wife did night audit for three, for seven years. And I looked at him, and I said, well, that's your wife, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> And for some reason, you know, he put me in the accounts department and I was the the um the income auditor. And that mm -hmm. was just an opening into the world of how hotels operated in terms of the cost, in terms of the revenues, how the revenues worked, in terms of the different departments, etc. And it was very, mm -hmm. very interesting. But I th you know, as as all things, it it ran um it had a a, a life and so after that, I went to the University of the West Indies. And again, I thought it was serendipitous, but God had a plan. I sat down over a bowl of soup on a Saturday and I said, and there was this newspaper and I was reading it. And there was uh, these late applications for persons to do French, history and literature. And I did three, all those three at A-levels. And I was mm -hmm. like, my name, which one should I choose? I'll choose history. Mm -hmm. And I, I chose history, I applied and I was successful. And then I went on to Trinidad to live with my my sister and my brother-in-law at that time. Another great uh, experience in my life, again, when I look back, you know, it was a safe home. Mm -hmm. It was a family home. It was a home where you were encouraged to excel. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I at that time, of course, you're walking through it. You don't, you don't see. But when you look back and you hear about stories of persons who left the nest of their mother and transitioned to maybe a family member or not. And they've had such mm -hmm. you know, challenging experiences. You say, thank God, you know, for, for ordering your steps and for covering you during yes. that time. Yes. And I really, I really met some wonderful friends, friends that I have up until today that we mm -hmm. meet every time I go to Trinidad, you know, they, were, they came to my wedding. We celebrate events. We celebrate uh, births of their children. And so on. So, so university to me, it was is a place where you grow up, as Alana, you know, it's a place where you come into your own, where you become yeah. more self-assured and so on. And then yeah. I, I worked at the British High Commission again, another uh, to me a landmark experience because it opened up an entirely different world. And I always remember when I worked at the British High Commission, I went in and I saw these stacks of files on the ground, and I was like, what is that? And they told me, um, this is all the people who applied for your job. And wow. Said, all of those, and it was, it, I'm, I'm five feet one. It was clearly <laughs> a four foot pile of files. I mean, people applied. Wow. And, wow. and I, back and I was like, why did I get this job out of all of those persons? You know, mm -hmm. of course, you know, it is that the fact that my lines are falling in pleasant places, you know, and again, mm -hmm. God opened doors for me. And, and that really showed me the possibility of a life beyond Trinidad and Tobago, the possibility of studying in the UK, the possibility of scholarships 
to um, mm -hmm. fund your higher education, you know, because we have a very sort of myopic picture. And I didn't come from a family of university graduates. So there was no sort of mentorship. There was no sort of guidance in that regard. You know, it was just, I, I, I would say, God recognizing you have ability and just providing the opportunity and you equipping yourself to really walk through those doors. So, you know, I always tell my students, don't worry about the family, your family of origin. You know, if you work hard and if you equip yourself, when opportunity meets preparation, you can walk through the door, you know? And I would say that that is something that happened to me. So it was quite life changing. And I went on to get a British Evening Scholarship and a Tobago House of Assembly mm -hmm. Scholarship. And I studied in the UK at the University of Surrey. And that was around my, I was probably coming into my 30s, of course, you know, a full womanhood. And, and yes. meeting people from, from Greece, from the Seychelles, from Mauritius, from the UK, from Jamaica, you know, from Zambia, from Tanzania. It was a wonderful experience just living and living in the UK. And then I went on to work in the UK. And I, I think, um, of course, people always say, so how you went on to do a PhD? So I, I graduated with distinction. And uh, there were a number of scholarships on offer. And I applied for three of them. Mm. Um, because you know, I was I was single. I, I didn't have any kids. Yes. I had no, no, no responsibilities back in TND. So I was like, oh, well, mm. no. You know, and I applied for yes. all the scholarships and I got them. I got all wow. three. And then I I wow! Chose yes, I chose, uh, I wow. chose you one at Brunel, and my my PhD supervisor was um, Professor John Tribe, and I said, "So you mm. know, you, you really like these?" Because previously, my my colleague, um, Akola Cameron, and Donna Chambers, mm -hmm. Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica, they had also gotten scholarships. I said, well, "You you know," mm -hmm. and he said, "You know why? Because the University of the West Indies students can write. I don't have to, I don't have to handhold mm. you all." And so I, I have to put a plug here for the UWI because Interesting. it's a premier university in the region. But, mm -hmm. you know, we have really produced a lot of scholars and we have produced, um, we, we are good for, we are good for literacy. We are good for analysis. We are good for, you know what I mean? So I, I mm -hmm. don't knock it at all because it is what really opened up the PhD higher education door for me. Um, wow. And then that, of course, I went on to work in the UK. I worked at the Manchester Metropolitan University. And the turning point was, um, for those of you who live and worked in the UK at any point in time, I don't know how you feel about it, but I didn't mind the cold so much as I, I minded the darkness, you know, <laughs> the isolation mm -hmm. also came with that. Okay, so Shoma, we're going to stick up in here. For those listening, you're listening to Hard Talk Between Sisters, and we are streaming from the islands of the Caribbean. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Are you ready to dive into heart-to-heart -heart conversations that touch your soul? Look no further than Heart Talk Between Sisters, your story segment. Join us for a journey of laughter, tears, and unbreakable bonds as we explore the unique connection between sisters. From shared memories to deep reflections, our segment is a safe space to celebrate sisterhood in all its beauty and complexity. Let your heart soar as we discuss love, life, and everything in between, all with the understanding and warmth only sisters can provide. Whether you're reminiscing about childhood adventures or seeking advice on navigating life's twists and turns, Heart Talk Between Sisters is here for you. Tune in and feel the love radiate through the airwaves. Don't miss out on the magic of sisterly connection. Tune in to Heart Talk Between Sisters, your story segment today. For more information, call 1-868-743-4133. That's 1-868-743-4133.
Okay, we are back on Hot Talk Between Sisters with my guest. I am Alana Wheeler, and my guest today is Dr. Shuma Roberts, born and bred in the island of Tobago, but currently living in Barbados. And Shuma, you just shared with us so many things concerning your life um, from childhood and how you progress from Tobago to Trinidad to working in the British High Commission to going to England receiving three scholarships or three plus scholarships, we'd say, and having to choose which one to take to do the PhD. So I want to go back a little bit to talk about a little bit more about some of the things you shared um, in the past segment. And you mentioned that um, you worked at a hotel in Tobago and you worked in the accounting department. And it's interesting to see, you know, because most times persons who work in the hotel industry and end up remaining in the hotel industry, I would say, for years. Usually a, a person who may work them, they work their way up in the industry. But you have a very interesting work experience and work academic combination because you have worked in the industry for many years and then you transitioned into academia in the same industry. You know, and I think that that is amazing. And, and to me, that is um, I think that's the, one of the best ways to really progress into a profession when you have that practical experience. Because when you have that practical experience, you know, you're able to know when you read the academic behind it and you read the literature behind it, you're then able to understand because you've had the practical experience. You know, that is so important. So I just wanted to know a little bit more about what was that like, you know, while you were studying um, the academic aspect of tourism in England, um, you know, how was your hotel experience? Were you able to draw from that hotel experience to bring it into the PhD experience and, you know, the academia? Tell us some more about that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I Well, first of all, I worked in the industry for 1989 to 1991. So it was not a very mm -hmm. long time, but it was long enough for me to have made some observations what I did at my master's was uh, tourism planning and development. So it wasn't hospitality at all. But what mm -hmm. I found that in my teaching, that experience is very important. So that I could connect, you know, I could walk students through, you know, the various aspects. It's not just the barman and the waitress. It's not just the um, housemaid, you know. It, it is also, or room attendant rather. You know, they're all other specializations and skills that are required to make the hospitality industry function as it should. But we don't see those things. We don't see the back office, you know, the engineer with the accountant, um, the marketing person. We only see the front of house person. So I'm able to, in my teaching in particular, I'm able to make those links with students a lot better than if I had not worked in the industry. And I recall uh, maybe two or three years into starting to teach at Cave Hill, I decided mm -hmm. that I wanted to go to a hotel like um, during the summer so I could mm -hmm. work and sort of, you know, come back with experiences for, for students. And I did that once at a hotel in Antigua. And that was very, very useful. I did a, I also did a project on absenteeism and why persons, why, why persons were absent um, mm -hmm. from the industry with a high level of absenteeism. And, and so, you know, that experience working the summer because I was more up to date, you know, I was able again to mm -hmm. help students make better decisions around um, around their choices. Yes. But, you know, I don't know how many, how many lecturers would do something like that, you know, because I think it's really, and I don't know how many lecturers in tourism and that would actually go and go back and work in the industry or have come out of working in any aspect of the industry. I mean, I remember I because I went to hotel school um, soon after I did my A-levels or advanced levels, I went to hotel school and I had this grand dream of owning my own hotel and running my own hotel. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that just did not materialize, you know? As yet. Um, <laughs> as, yet as yet, as you rightfully said, as yet. Maybe that is something in retirement to happen, right? But, you know, yes, and I do love, I very much love the industry. I've always loved the industry, uh, which, you know, my life took a different direction. 
Um, but I have found that even with the experience and the training that I had in the industry, I was still able to apply it in my background in national security because I found myself going into hotels and going into um, airlines and training airline staff, training mm -hmm. hotel staff um, on, on what to look for on the indicators of human trafficking which was really interesting because in preparing those training modules, I was, because I was so familiar with how the hotel business operates and yeah. how um, a bit of how the airline operates I, and even the airports and how they function, that sort of thing. I was able to, to, to add some practical experiences to it, you know, because I remember being at the hotel school and um, I actually trained at Hilton in Trinidad in their housekeeping for three days. So I remember going with the maids on the floors and things like that. So, you know, looking for human traffic in any case as it always comes in. So I'm rambling on about this, but this is hard talk between sisters, right? So I'm sharing with you things that are on my own heart. Um, as as yeah. you talk, you know, it's triggering, triggering all those wonderful memories of um, things from the past and from childhood. So, yeah, yeah so I, I really highly commend you on being able to make that connection and that link between the practical and the academic. Because, you know, what is the purpose of the, the um, academia if it's not to influence policy, you know? Um, yeah, and so you want to be able to influence policy in a way that the policy can be applied and can be used by the policy makers. So um, going back into what you shared in the, in the first uh, 20 minutes on hard talk between sisters, you also mentioned some interesting things about, well, we know Mr. A. N. R. Robinson, that is Arthur Napoleon Raymond Robinson, highly, highly internationally respected man who actually was instrumental in starting the International Criminal Court in The Hague and also was instrumental in so many other things. He was the only person in Trinidad to hold the position of prime minister and president in our country. And, you know, so highly, highly respected gentleman, again, from the island of Tobago, someone who you and I, we actually know him in a personal way, you know, because mm -hmm. we would have walked with him and interacted with him while being in Tobago. So so it's, it's an honor to know um, that you, you went to school next to <laughs> where you went. <laughs> you yeah, know? Absolutely. absolutely. I, remember, yeah. I remember going to, I think it was 2006, and I did a presentation at the then um, Hilton Hotel in Tobago, now the Magdalena yeah. Grand yeah. Resort. And he was sitting in the audience, and after I presented, you know, yeah. he, 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 I sat next, or he called me and, you know, he said, well done, my, my child, you know, well done. I'm so wow. proud of you. And, you know, I always remember that as quite a seminal moment in my life because of course, yes. you, know, you know, your beginnings and, you know, he was far removed from that in a yes. sense, personally, and, yeah. and for him to really commend me, you know, it was something, but you, you mentioned something earlier and I want mm. to say to the audience, you know, when I think back and I, I'm sure you do your your life is such a finely and intricately woven tapestry that you don't even realize the interconnections until you mm -hmm. go ahead and then you cast your eye back and you say oh well that is why I had to work in the industry like you have done you know mm -hmm. yes that and so you, you know what a room look like so you're not in awe yes. <laughs> and so yes. on so yes, yes I'm always amazed at you know mm -hmm. how how our lives are so well well woven yes and you know something and you meant you mentioned god and that you became a christian at the age of 13 and when god has planned out your life you know um sometimes we don't understand why things happen and why why it takes a turn because you know there you are working in the hotel business and then made a turn you ended up in trinidad ended up at the british high commission and somebody might ask well what's the connection you know between the british high commission and working in a hotel you know, but not knowing that that was a stepping stone for you to get to England and mm -hmm. to get these scholarships and to get all these things that you would have gotten. So, you know, so so we, we sometimes question God, but God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And he's all knowing and all wise, you know, and um, as you rightly said, only when we look back, we're able to appreciate um, why, we, why our paths had to go in a particular direction. So um, this is so I'm really enjoying this so much on hard talk between sisters, and you know so I want to go on to talk about some of the things you mentioned. You mentioned that um, while you were in Trinidad, 
making the decision about university or studies, um, you had no, no, no one to really mentor you. And I think that's important for the persons who are listening. We have a lot of young women listening, even young men who are listening. And, um, you know, sometimes people look for the excuse, well, I didn't have any father figure. I didn't have any adult in my life to guide me. If I had somebody to guide me, then I wouldn't have ended up in this. I wouldn't have ended up in that. You know, but here you are saying that you did not have a mentor, but somehow you were able to still um, achieve certain things and accomplish certain things. Um, you mentioned the importance of God in your life and God guiding your life. So you want to share some more about that in terms of not having somebody, not having a mentor, somebody okay. not having an adult, a responsible adult to really guide them or to influence them in a positive way. What would you say to that person from your own experience? Yeah, um, th there's always a community. There's always a community. So I might not, nobody in my family prior to me went to university. Um, and I recall at my schoolmates, I, re I so vividly recall some of them sitting and, you know, doing SATs and uh, applying to the University of the West Indies. And I never quite understood what was going on because that seemed to be a reality so far removed from me. Mm -hmm. But I had a church community, and while, you know, I recall the pastor's daughter, um, she went off to university at that time, Peggy, Peggy Arnold, and there were other people who went off to university, but again, it seemed far removed. Um, and then in my own, in my own community, I can't remember anybody actually going off to university, but sometimes... I would say God put things in our path and we have to make a decision. So I was reading the newspaper, Alana, over a bowl of soup. I remember that that Saturday <laughs> and I saw the ad and uh, I said, oh, university late application. My sister had just got married and moved to Trinidad. So yeah. immediately I say, okay, if I go, I have a, I have a place to go. And without asking her, right, this, this is taking everything for granted. Um, my mother had just retired, um, so I know she didn't have the funds. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, okay, but I have a place to say I don't have the funds. So how am I going? But let me apply anyhow. You yeah. know, so it, in a sense, it was a it was a, a leap of faith, and then I, they said yes, and everything came into motion. I remember a friend going to the U.S. that summer, and she bought me everything that I needed. The toiletries, the trainers, the trousers. The... Wow. She bought me. I remember the church rallying. I remember mm -hmm. taking a loan that year because I remember my mother. She was building her whole her, her, her other house, and I, yes. I, I'm not the, I'm not the child who asks. Yeah, so I remember <laughs> saying, "I'm take a loan." Yes. But yes. The second year, the church paid my fees, and wow. the third year, I got a scholarship. It was wow. a Canada Alumni Scholarship. Wow. And my sister would tell you that in the three years I lived with her, that I never asked her for $20. I never wow. asked her for 10 or 5 wow. And I don't know. It was just the providence of God right through. There was a neighbor. Yes. Her name was, I, I now call her Auntie Margaret, but she was Dr. Margaret Rouse Jones. Mm -hmm. And my brother said, um, Shuma, Shuma, she works at the university. You know, you need to put yourself in a place where you could get a drop. <laughs> I remember putting myself in a place where I could get a lift to go to university. Wow. And she became a mentor to me. She became a friend. She became my mother. You yes. know? Um, and and just, just from different avenues, uh, Milana, mm -hmm. I was fed. Like, with, like the raven, I was fed and I... I never went hungry. I never went at all clothes. I, you know, God just took care of me. So what would I say to people? You have a community. Understand whether that community enhances your life or does not. If they don't mm -hmm. enhance your life, then you need to shift communities. So surround mm -hmm. yourself with positive people and always be in preparation mode. So you can't enter university. You can't get a job unless you are equipped. So equip yourself. Mm -hmm. And, yes. and, and no more than ever, there are so many free things that governments are offering to people. Yes. Just do. Yes. So when the opportunity comes, you are ready to walk through that door. And you might never walk through at the top, 
just yes. getting through that door and having a positive attitude and having a good attitude, not just positive, but being respectful yeah. and, you know, learning to speak up for yourself and being confident. All of these things grow with you. I mean, they're not, mm -hmm. you know, we're not imbued with them at all. We, we, we develop them yeah. at the time. So, so surround yourself with a community that will enhance and uplift your life. That That is what I would say to anybody. Yeah. Yes, and that is well said and well received on my part, and I'm sure on many of you listeners. Um, you know, when you said about um, what I hear from you is you know, a, a determination. There was a determination on your part, and you looked for opportunities. You didn't wait for anything to fall in your lap. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't know if the, the persons who don't understand that terminology, you know, from the Caribbean, what we mean by that, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't wait for anything to come to you and nothing was given to you on a silver platter or on a gold platter. You went out and you looked for the opportunities because you saw yourself in a better place. You wanted to be in a better place and you saw yourself there and you looked, went out looking for it, you know. So I think those are important things really. And also, I mean, the mentor, you took up the opportunity of that. The person told you, position yourself where you could meet this lady, Dr. Margaret. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you could have said, well, I don't have time for that. That's a waste of time. But you didn't. You said, okay, I will position myself and I'll make sure that I'm in the place where she could see me, I could meet her, and then things will kick off from there. So it's really making use of the little opportunity. So there really is very little excuse for anybody. Right? Um, I know of university students years ago. I mean, young people now, they may not consider this important, but I know of university students years ago who went to university classes at UE with slippers on their feet, rubber slippers on their feet, because they didn't have shoes to be able to go into classes, you know? Um, young people now, I don't know if that's what they will do, but that's the extent to which somebody is so determined to get something you know, and to make something of themselves. And we're not saying that university means you're making something of yourself because you may not be the person for university. You may be the person that attends a technical school or has a particular skill or gifted with your hands and that you're able to attend some kind of vocational or technical classes and you can use that skill to do something with yourself, you know, because we have some very talented electricians, and um, hairdressing persons, nail technicians, all these different areas don't require university degrees necessarily, but very gifted and very talented. So there are opportunities out there. And as Shuma said, you know, there are free courses available in Trinidad and Tobago. In some of the other countries, it's possible that there are free courses available. There are also online courses available um, for persons who some of them are free, some of them are not, you know, so the opportunities are there. So thank you so much, Shilma, for sharing that. And we stick a pin right here and we'll take another break on Heart Talk Between Sisters. We will be right back. Bijou Caribbean Connect. For over 44 years, Bijou Caribbean Connect has been a global multimedia streaming service for radio and television, with its headquarters based in Trinidad and Tobago. As a registered business, we specialize in providing radio and television platforms for international organizations and offering marketing technical assistance to help them amplify their messages. One of our key initiatives is the development of a website that can be translated into over 65 languages, ensuring effective communication in the language of our users. Through our systems, we enable professional dialogues on various topics such as business, politics, religion, and more, facilitated by our international conference call system. With the capacity to accommodate up to 1,000 participants and offering 55 international phone numbers, we provide a seamless and inclusive communication experience. Additionally, we operate 20 global radio stations, with WCAN Radio serving as our flagship station, integrated with social media platforms. By partnering with us, we strive to promote your business and organization both locally and internationally. At Bijou, we continue to expand our network, building a reservoir of clientele, products, and services that span the globe. 
Through our interconnected infrastructure and cutting-edge technology, we can effectively broadcast your information from our studios to any location on the planet. Our focus lies in directing your message to the smart devices of citizens worldwide, ensuring accessibility and facilitating connections with your intended audience. We actively seek global partnerships with businesses, organizations, and professionals from diverse fields. Moreover, we welcome ear reporters from every country who can contribute news and events directly from their locations to our studio. Moreover, we provide opportunities for your business organization, ministry, or professional service to be featured in our app. To get started on this exciting journey, please reach out to us at your convenience via call or WhatsApp. Furthermore, we blend the convenience of a shopping experience with our service offerings. With over 2,500 retail stores and partnerships with major universities worldwide, we, we look forward to connecting with you and exploring the possibilities of collaboration. Okay, we are back on Hard Talk Between Sisters this Friday afternoon as we all wind down at the end of our week and we're having a hot or a cold drink and our feet are up and we're just waiting for the Saturday and Sunday when we can relax for those of us who don't work on Saturdays and Sundays. And my guest today is Dr. Shilma Roberts from the island of Tobago. She currently works as a senior lecturer in the University of the West Indies and Cave Hill, Barbados. So we are here in the Caribbean region and we're streaming to you wherever you are in the world, in the African continent, in the Northern continent, North America, South America, Asia, the UK, wherever you are in the world, we are reaching you with hard talk between sisters. So Shilma, my dear sister, on the, the last, as we get to the last part of our, our segment, this today's segment, um, I have two questions for you. Number one, why a PhD? Why a PhD? Well, I think I, I sort of touched on it a little earlier when I said after my master's, uh, these opportunities arose. And when I looked around in terms of my responsibilities, there were very few in terms of familial responsibility. There was no husband. There were no children, you know. So I thought, well, why not, you know? If this opportunity is being given to me, I should walk through this door. And and so that's that's when I decided, yes, I, I'll go for it. And it was also being funded, so I didn't, I, I didn't have to. <laughs> didn't have it's to funny, so why not? <laughs> exactly. In terms of the whole reparation movement and so on, I thought, oh, this is a good, this is a good uh, way to yeah. reparate somebody, you know. So yes, yeah. I, I took advantage of the opportunity. Yes. And I live wow, and you just happen to be in the right place at the right time too. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. So, that, that is a blessing. Yes, I, I enjoy the PhD experience. Anybody who might be listening and who is doing a PhD currently, I just want to let you know that, you know, the longest night has an end. It's a very lonely road, but you just mm. need to get milestones. Um, have have your, your own community of friends. The days you feel to work, you know, really push the work. There might be a day you get up and you can't do anything. No, no, don't, don't force yourself. Guilt is a, um, guilt is a, a strange bedfellow when it comes to your PhD. If you don't do work for a day, you know, <laughs> you mm. feel very badly. Um, mm. But you, you probably your, your body and your mind is probably just saying, just take a rest. And I just used to jump mm. on a bus and go to Oxford or you know, or somewhere nearby and just walk around and then the next day I was good to go. 
Because well, you had many beautiful options in England, doing a PhD in England. I mean, my gosh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, wherever you are, you might, have, you might have the beach, you might have the mountains, you might just have a coffee shop around the corner, whatever you have. I always say use whatever you have and enjoy yeah. the abundance of life. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, you, might, you mentioned coffee shop and oh my gosh, I was just telling somebody today, Barbados have such beautiful cafes. So for the students in Barbados, you know, I mean, I, I live in Trinidad and, and I'm like, I'm in awe at the, the beauty of the cafes that Barbados has. I could just sit there and just bask in it. You know, they're just beautiful. <laughs> you know, they're, they're really, really beautiful. They're unique. They're special. And so, you know, PhD students who are studying in Barbados, I mean, you have some lovely options there of what you can do in a so even a very small island like Barbados. So, so yeah, yeah. so congrats to Barbados. Lovely place to visit, <laughs> lovely place to live. You know, yeah. I'm kind of a bit jealous of you kind of thing, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, the grass always is green on the other side, I guess. But I mean, I, I believe the grass is greener on that side, you know. Just see. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lovely place to live, and it's very interesting how I came to live here. As I said, I was working at Manchester Metropolitan University in the UK, and um, mm -hmm. I found the darkness so isolating. Mm -hmm. uh, and I saw the students, you know, I don't know if I was an um, oddity or what, but my classes used to be full, and they just used to be like, you know, eating mm -hmm. out of my hands because I'm bringing this developing country perspective that they've yes. never heard before. And yes. I, and I said, well, why am I enriching these students? And I have a whole Caribbean community. Wow. That is my, and, and so I reached out to, I reached out to um, colleagues in St. Augustine. At that yeah. time, they had just uh, recruited two PhDs in tourism. Yes. So they were four. So I said, okay, well, there are three campuses. Let me reach out to Barbados. And again... You know, time, timing is, is, is everything. They were looking yes. for a, a lecturer in tourism, a PhD. And wow. um, I just I just went and I remember in the, in the UK, they wanted me to, to apply for the job I was in. Mm. And I apply for the job I'm in? Well, what is this? And mm. then I, I was waiting for the contract to come true. And mm. I recall... When I got it, I said, well, you know, actually, I'm going to the Oxford of the Caribbean. And all of a sudden, I didn't have to apply anymore. The job was mine. Wow. I, I say this to say um, to everyone that you have to know your worth. You have to know what, what you bring mm -hmm. to the table. Yes. And it's very important to walk in that knowledge. Don't oversell yourself or undersell yourself. Understand mm -hmm. your value. And they were, they were, op all the doors were suddenly open up for me to stay. But I really, it was not about the university because I, I had wonderful colleagues. It was about the isolation. And mm. so I came to Barbados on the 7th of September, the 12th of September, 2005. Wow. And the rest of history. Yes, I yes. enjoy, I enjoy living here. It is a, a safe place, a wonderful place, um, and a yes. happy medium. In UK and Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, well, you know, don't rub it in. And just don't, please don't rub it in here, all right? My heart is hurting. This is hard talk between sisters, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't give me a broken heart here now. <laughs> so, yeah, but you know what? When you said about knowing your worth, and I love that, you know, I really love that um, as women. You know, it's it segues into what I would, my next question was, which is really how did you handle yourself as a woman, um, as a woman in the industry, as a woman doing a PhD, as a woman living in England, such a large place. Um, you mentioned about it being lonely and it's dark and all of that. I mean, those are opportunities there where you would have been extremely vulnerable at those times. And, you know, how did you handle that as a woman? You spoke about your worth, knowing your worth. I mean, e easier said than done when you're in a very vulnerable situation as you were in while you were in England. So you want to share some bits about that? Um, that's, you know, it's not something that I've actually reflected on as you, as you sort of go through. But I have always had a community. 
So I had my mm -hmm. friend Donna, I had um, Auntie, another person I met serendipitously or through the grace of God or the timing of God. I was on the platform of the Surrey station. I was going home and she was there. I think it was like 5 a.m. in the morning. And I call her Auntie. Her name is Judith Nicholas. And uh, um, I said, good morning. And she said, you must be from from the Caribbean because nobody says good morning. <laughs> she, she, she adopted me. She, when I say adopted, like full on adopted. Um, mm. If you look in my house, the crockery, the cutlery, the really expensive things, the holidays. She, she just She just took me into her heart and her home. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had her, so I think I've always had a sense of covering Alana. Um, mm -hmm. so you asked me how I navigated. I, I never allowed the sense of, I understood I was isolated because of the darkness, mm -hmm. but I never, I never, um, sort of welcomed and embraced and indulged loneliness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I made a very deliberate effort not to let loneliness overtake me because it's a rabbit hole mm -hmm. and when you go down a rabbit hole it means to dig yourself back out it's hard i my mom died during my phd she died in she wow. died one year into my phd and wow. last, last words to me were uh i'm coming to your graduation i said mommy are you coming to my graduation and she said yes oh, oh <laughs> and yeah. Uh, um, I would re I recall writing and the tears are just coming on my computer. I, yes. I never stopped. I, I, I ended in the three years I was supposed to end because she is a pragmatist and she would say, hey, I ain't going on holiday, girl. <laughs> it's better than <laughs> even my dream. You know, you, will, you have to get on with it. And yes. so I think it is my pragmatism that has really got me through the grace of God, staying grounded. You know, sometimes you wander away from God, but he never wanders away yeah. from us. That's right. Us close, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and so it is. it was my community that really, I think, helped yeah. me to it. Academia, yeah. I enter academia feeling, I, with a sense that I'm a woman. I know this is hard talk between sisters. And sisters yes. sometimes, I don't start from the place that I'm a woman. I start from the place that I'm a human being. Right. In the world. <laughs> yes. Wow. And some people have more value than you. People have less value to offer the world than you. But you have a unique value to offer to the world. So yeah. know what that value is and walk in it. And every day, live to impart that value to the world. So. Yeah. Amen. Oh my God, sounds like you're preaching to us, man. <laughs> I'm preaching. <laughs> hard talk between sisters. We have a heart to heart conversation on a Friday afternoon here in the Caribbean. So, you know, Shilma, as you, you went through a tough time during the PhD. You know, that's yeah. tough. That's a lot to deal with in a strange land, not knowing mm -hmm. many people. But it always seems that in your life, you just always go in the right place at the right time, you know, that things just happened, getting the PhD, being in the British High Commission, getting the scholarships, um, community, you mentioned community and persons just offering themselves to you to support you and be there for you. Um, that's just really being in the right place at the right time and also God just orchestrating yeah. and ordering your steps. You yeah. know, because when the Bible says the steps of a righteous man, they are ordered by God. You know, it's like your footsteps were ordered by God, literally, yeah. down to the yeah. train station and all. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's, that's, that, that's, that's, that's I, amazing. You know, yeah, the Bible says, I will instruct you and teach you in a way you should go. I will guide you with my own eye. Yeah. And that 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 has been that has been my experience. And of course, uh, persons who might be listening might be saying, "Oh, this is a superwoman." I, I'm not a superwoman. I am um, subject to human frailties, like like everybody else. And you might be asking about love and relationships. Um, yes. Yeah, I've had my fair share of love and relationships. I I am married. I got yeah. married in 2017, and it is really 
really about how we confront things. Always when you're walking through something, it seems so, you know, you seem so overwhelmed because you're just seeing mm -hmm. it in front of you. But sometimes as I look back, if we just pause and quiet yeah. ourselves, we would get yeah. the answer. And for anybody who is contemplating marriage, uh, Alana, you, I would have said this to you. Yeah. Really to ensure that you and the person have the same values. So yeah. I remember you, you know, I said, yeah. oh, it's just a Christian. But do you have the same yeah. values around, around God, around family, around money, yeah. around sex, yeah. around yeah. commitment? You know, just how yeah. the things that you prioritize I ensure that that person has those values and, you know, two can work yeah. together if they, if they agree. So they agree, yes. Wow, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila, for that advice. I take that advice and I hope that the, anyone listening out there, male or female, man or woman, would take the advice um, you've given, talking from experience with relationships and with marriage. Um yeah, I, I, you know, I, sometimes, you know, life experiences could make us a bit tough um, and like Teflon. You know, some people call it like a Teflon spirit or they say, you know, it's like water of a duck's back, you yeah. know. Um, would you say that, you know, throughout your life or at any point in your life, the things you would have gone through sort of made you tough, tough in a way? Yeah, um, so... So, yes, living in England, you had to be strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember this lady saying, oh, you will never finish your PhD in three years. You dress too well. And I could, wow. not, find, I could not find a link between those two things. Yes. So, you know, <laughs> and, and then, uh, you know, you, you saw people gossiping and, and so on. So what, what that did to me is that I always block out the noise. As long mm -hmm. as you are not disrespectful to me, Alana, like, mm -hmm. I am not concerned about what is said about me, you know. Mm -hmm. So that has made me tough. Um, I think mm -hmm. my relationship experiences have also made me tough. Um, mm -hmm. And my my mantra now, and I think mm -hmm. you have to walk through it, is when someone shows you who they are, believe them. And I think oh, wow. sometimes women, we don't believe because the way a man might be presented he might present himself like, you know, you're so soft and so gentle and so kind. But I'm mm -hmm. not looking behind the curtain to see the other things. But then I might look behind the curtain and see something. I said, nah, you, you're too sweet for me. You can't be like that. And so <laughs> in this constant stage of denial, but when somebody shows you who they are, uh, don't, don't, I would say, don't give them another. And some of my friends think I'm harsh. I say, mm -hmm. but the evidence, I'm a social scientist and I, I, I look at the evidence. Yes. And the evidence does not support the narrative, then I, I can't go with the narrative because the evidence doesn't support it. And I know I've gotten here over time. I don't expect everybody to embrace it at this time. Yes. Uh, but this has just been a journey for me and, and um, it has been a journey of growth. And so those those experiences in terms of living in the UK, maybe being in academia, um, because you write and you think, oh, that is a wonderful piece that I've just written. And then somebody sends you back a review and says, oh, what, what rubbish is this? <laughs> and you have yeah. to do a double turn. You, you have to humble yeah. yourself and say, well, actually, I really didn't see, but it takes. So yes. it makes me tough, but not not uncompassionate that's not a word yeah um, I'm still compassionate i'm still empathetic i'm still sympathetic but i know you know where the lines are to be drawn um, yeah and as i think you know we are all a work in progress till we all come <laughs> we are we are all a work in progress you know and in my line of work with what you mentioned there about when somebody shows themselves who they really are believe them in my line of work, we call that red flags or indicators. Right. You know? Yeah. And people show red flags. It may not pop up too often, but it pops up. And when it pops up, it's glaring like a red yeah. flag. Yeah. Yeah. Take so, note, pay attention. We so you want know? to recommend sometimes, you know, that we just ignore the red flags. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh. Yes. And they're very glaring. They might just pop for about a five seconds or five minutes, but. <laughs> 
when it shows up, it might be five minutes out of knowing them for five months, yeah. but it's an important five minutes. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot yeah. of you speak a lot about community. Uh, you don't have to have a lot of friends. I, I have a lot of friends. I have friends at Epochs. So I have my Tobago friends, my British High Commission friends, my UE friends, and so on. Uh, and it might, not, it might be three at a time, but they have yes. been steady. Yes. Know? Keep, keep yeah. community. Keep community. They, yeah. they, Thank they, God. They, that is a blessing. Eh? That's a blessing yeah. to have that. And yeah. you know, I have a, a dear friend of mine, a dear friend of ours, um, Tanisha, Tanisha Brown Williams. You know, one thing I admire with her is that she is so fantastic at networking and having yes. networks, you know. Um, I, I admire her with that. Such a I mean, she's young, huh? she's not yeah. as young as we are, you and I. Um, <laughs> you know, but but I she's young so. for such a young yeah. person to to really be using those networks and building those and keeping the networks and it forms a community in a sense there eh? you know um because you know we have networks that are out there they're more external they're a little further out and then you have the networks that are closer and close knit that you keep close to you and yeah. that you maintain those relationships and you nurture and you build on those relationships you know, yeah. so very important. Um, and you have endorsed it again this afternoon in your sharing Heart Talk Between Sisters. So yeah. I thank you so much, Shuma, for taking the time out. Um, yeah. I thank you so much for offering yourself to share on Heart Talk Between Sisters and for being so open and honest about your life experiences. Um, you know, we're going to have this, we're going to share this with you so that you'll have it um, for your records, um, future records. And certainly we would love to have you back on our program. I wanted to ask you, you know, before we end actually, there is something that was sent to me from Lowani. And Lowani is Leaders of All Nations International. Uh, and they are a group comprising women and men from over 190 countries in the world. And they said something on a chat, and I said, this looks so interesting. So I wanted to read it with you. Sure, that was the first time you're going to be hearing it. But I wanted to get your thoughts on this, because I find it very interesting. So um, this is it. When the Chinese decided to live in peace, they built the Great Wall of China. They thought that no one would climb it because of its height. However, in the 100 years after its construction, the Chinese were invaded three times more. Enemy infantry soldiers never had the need to climb or penetrate the wall because they always bribed the guards and got in through the gates. Do we still have Shuma? Okay. I think um, we lost her, but I'll still read. Great. Shuma is back with us. All right. So the Chinese had built high and thick walls, but they couldn't build the characters of the wall guards. Mm -hmm. As a result, building human character is different and important. It precedes the construction of everything else. This is what the new generation needs to do. As an Orientalist said, if you want to destroy the civilization of a nation, there are three ways. Destroy the family structure. Destroy the education system. Belittle and demean the role models and references. To destroy the family, belittle and degrade the motherhood. To destroy the education system, do not give importance to educators and teachers and lower their reputation in society so that their students will despise and belittle them. Belittle the reputation of role models. Work insidiously to destroy scholars and scientists so that they are suspected and no one listens to them or follows them. When the conscious mother is lost, the dedicated teachers are lost and the role models are discredited, who will teach human values to young people? Mm -hmm. I know it was a mouthful, mm -hmm. but what I found stood out with me most when you in your context is the education system. They say destroy the education system, and to destroy that, you destroy the educators and the teachers and lower their reputation. Mm -hmm. You know, to make them irrelevant, work at serious to make scholars and scientists irre irrelevant so that people will suspect the things and the ideas that they will be presenting. Um, I find it is an interesting analogy. And I do remember looking at this movie on, um, I think it was the Great Wall of China, 
where mm-hmm. they um there were these this army that lived inside of the wall of China and they defended the wall every time these monsters came to attack the wall. Mm-hmm. And it really was true. The way that they got through that wall was by breaching the wall, number one. They bore a hole through the wall, right, mm-hmm. and went under, and that they actually targeted the gates, the entrance gates of the walls, mm-hmm. you know? Um so it's interesting. It's kind of like um, the Troy, the movie Troy, where it has the Trojan horse, you know. So this, so they, they way to destroy and to get into a, a community or society is to infiltrate the society. And yeah. this is what this, this thing is talking about: infiltrate by bribing the guards, the wall guards, and stuff. So um, you know, when we're talking about education here, you're an education person. You're an academic person. Academia has its role in society. Education has its role in society. But when this thing ended and said, who will teach human values to young people? I said, but where is God mentioned in all of this? Yeah. God is the one, our value system, you know, the world value system, everything comes from the principles that God has established, the way we are to live with each other and the way we are to live as a community, you know. Um, and one of the persons I interviewed a couple of weeks ago, she, re- she wrote a book on the Beatitudes. And for those who don't know what the Beatitudes are, they are attitudes to be that are written in the Bible in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus spoke about several ways about how we are to live, to live with each other and how we are to live as persons, you know, a way of life. That's what Christianity is, a way of life. And that's the life that you have chosen, Shuma, to live from the age of 13. And we see from what you've shared on Heart Talk Between Sisters, how um, you deciding to follow the Christian way has shaped your life and made you into the person who you are today, not just a woman, as you said, because you're not just a woman, you're a human being. So it has made you into the human being that you are today, where you're strong, you're tough, but doesn't mean that you're uncaring and you are able to bypass the things that people say about you. You block out all the noise and the negative You've overcome many things in your life. Mom passing away while you're doing a PhD, which is a really tough thing to do. Crying while you're actually writing your PhD paper because of having lost your mom. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, not having mentors really there as a young person, but still choosing to pursue university education and beyond. You know, so, so we see so many great successes and good things happening in your life. There was also the bad, but you overcame the bad, you know? Mm-hmm. And and so we, we want to thank God, number one, for you and for your life and for sharing your life. And I just want to ask if there are any last parting words that you would want to say to our listeners. Alana, thank you so much for this opportunity. I think it was so important to have reflected, you know, very often we just forge on through life. You know, I, I am the... Okay, I've, I've conquered that mountain. What is the next mountain kind of thing? And, you know, mm. we don't take time to actually look back. And I thought that this was a really good opportunity for me to reflect. Reflect mm. on the faithfulness of God, even when I was not faithful. To reflect on, you know, how I, how he took me through failures and tears. And, you know, brought me out on top and with, with the lessons learned and so on. So, um. For people who, who, sisters who might be just having a tough time, um, mm-hmm. you will see the importance of it after. And it's, I don't know if that is any comforting words for you while you're going through it, but it's to build character in you and it's for you to be on heart to heart with sisters. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And to tell your story mm-hmm. to encourage the next the next person. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I really enjoy the, the reflections, the opportunity to reflect that it gave me, Alana. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you again. And thank you for tuning in to Hard Talk Between Sisters, where we inspire conversation and we encourage persons. Thank you to Dr. Green, Clarence Green, for facilitating today's session. And we do wish you all a wonderful weekend. And we look forward to talking with you or chatting with you on Hard Talk Between Sisters next Friday. God bless you all and goodbye. Are you ready to dive into heart-to-heart conversations that touch your soul? 
Look no further than, Heart Talk Between Sisters, your story segment. Join us for a journey of laughter, tears, and unbreakable bonds as we explore the unique connection between sisters. From shared memories to deep reflections, our segment is a safe space to celebrate sisterhood in all its beauty and complexity. Let your heart soar as we discuss love, life, and everything in between, all with the understanding and warmth only sisters can provide. Whether you're reminiscing about childhood adventures or seeking advice on navigating life's twists and turns, Heart Talk Between Sisters is here for you. Tune in and feel the love radiate through the airwaves. Don't miss out on the magic of sisterly connection. Tune in to Heart Talk Between Sisters, your story segment today. For more information, call 1-868-743-4133. That's 1-868-743-4133.